DNA synthesis for both of them, right? Interface is exactly the same. Mitosis, we have one cytokinesis. In meiosis, we have two cytokinesis events, right? One replication, two cell divisions for meiosis. Meiosis, you end up with four germ cells or gametes. Mitosis, two daughter cells, right? So four daughter cells versus two daughters. We didn't talk about this. Independent assortment is essentially what I was saying about pulling apart of homologous chromosomes, right? And it's a random whether all the blues go one way, all the reds, half the blues, half the reds, which half of the reds, which half of the blues, okay? And so a gene that's on chromosome 1 that you got from grandma and a gene that's on chromosome 11 that you got from grandma don't have to go together, right? They can go together or they can come apart. Grandma and grandpa can come together, grandma and grandma, grandpa and grandpa. They call that independent assortment of different genes. So that all the genes you've got from one chromosome don't stay together in the gamete. Right? You get that random assortment. That's independent assortment. We're going to talk about that more in the next lecture, too. Okay. Happens technically when the spindle grabs them, which is more like during prophase, but we actually see them coming apart in anaphase, right? That's where they're pulled apart. So independent assortment, meiosis one. All right, we'll get to that. Okay. Yes. Okay, so we talked about that. Blah, blah, blah. We did a little bit of this. I'm not skipping it, but we've, we've already talked about this and we kind of need to go on. Um, this is the example of sort of random or independent assortment, right? They could line up like this and pull apart this way, or they could line up like that and end up pulled apart like that, right? They're not showing you the middle steps, right? Dot, dot, dot between there. Because first we have to pull apart the homologs, then we pull apart the sisters. They're not, you know, they're just giving us the end product. Don't let that freak you out. I think it's a bad figure, but I didn't write this textbook. But they're just showing you how they line up here at metaphase really matters. In this case, it would be all the reds going one way, all the blues going the other way. This is what the gametes phenotypes would look like from those genes. If it lined up at metaphase this way, then these would be how those genes are sort, right? So brown eyes and black hair don't always have to go together. We're assuming brown eyes was on this one and black hair was on that one. Right? They can show up together, but they don't have to, right? Depends on how they've aligned and how they've assorted. Independent assortment. They, one gene does not control what assorts with another gene. Okay. Genetic diversity. Okay. Oh, so here was the, yeah, somebody asked me. So if we have this many distinct chromosomes and we can have either one go either way, there's 8.4 million different combinations of gametes just from meiosis one, just from that meiosis one. And then we add on top of it crossing over and they tell us the mass comes up to 64 trillion different possible offspring from two parents. So, yeah, every di how many people are on the planet now? Seven billion? Okay, so there's not going to be anybody like you on this planet. Unless you have an evil identical Okay, so we're going to talk about gametogenesis because I'm, I lied to you guys already today and yesterday. Ooh, here's some parts to be familiar with. Okay, so we're going to talk about oogenesis, the creation of eggs. This is the one that I totally lied about. I mean, I kind of told you a little bit at the beginning. 
So I didn't lie about what happens to the chromosomes, but I did lie about what happens during meiosis to get to the end product. As it turns out, we only get one functional egg. So one functional, one fun, one fun gamete at the end of oogenesis. Okay, and that's because remember that picture of the egg, the egg was gigantic and all the teeny little sperm on it? Because the egg needs to be in charge of all the protein, carbohydrates, fats, energy needed for that embryo to survive until implantation and hooking up with mom's vascular system. Okay, and that's a good seven or eight days from fertilization. So that zygote, which is the egg and sperm fusion, starts doing mitosis while it's traveling down the fallopian tubes hoping to find the uterus and implant. But for seven or eight days, it's getting no oxygen, no extra energy. Everything has to be stored up in that egg. So the egg's huge. So we can't afford to make four huge eggs from each cell. It's just not feasible. So what happens is from the beginning, Right? We do exactly what we're supposed to do. But when we do that first meiosis one, one of them gets all the cytoplasm and the other one is just a, essentially the DNA in a membrane. Okay, so one functional cell after meiosis one. There's that other guy, we call it a polar body. It exists, it usually sits there. It gets reabsorbed at some point. Okay. This is where we arrest in utero. And we don't finish meiosis one until it's that egg cycle to be ovulated. So essentially in utero, we go through G1, S, G2, and we're getting ready to do start into meiosis one, but we stop there. And so then all our eggs are just sitting around like that until it's their turn that month to be ovulated. Then they go through meiosis one. Upon ovulation, they don't go through meiosis two until they're fertilized. So we don't even waste the energy if there's no sperm available. Right? If there's no sperm around, it just gets washed out. Okay? If it gets fertilized, we go through meiosis two but again, all the cytoplasm just goes to one of them and the others are polar bodies. Just the DNA and just the membrane. And they end up being absorbed. Okay. So that we end up with one gigantic functional egg at the end. Yeah. It's unclear. So I think both have been seen. This one's drawn like um, right, we don't see the first polar body going through its split. There is evidence that that one does go through its split also and does, it doesn't do anything, but that it can. But they definitely see both of those polar, like in, 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 um, in an IVF and in vitro fertilization, yeah, you, they've seen three or two. So the, the cells usually do what they're supposed to do, but those are not functional. Right. They're, yep. No. So multiples are, so none of these would be functional, right? These guys are just totally non-functional. If a sperm happened to get in there, they have no, they have not enough energy to do anything, right? So that's the cell that needs to be fertilized with the sperm. They're showing these gigantic, just like this would be the egg and then this would be the polar body. You know, in reality, they're teeny tiny, but they can't, you know, they're just trying to show you what they look like so you can count the chromosomes in them. But they're really tiny. They're the size of the sperm, essentially, or smaller, because they don't even have any of the other structures that the sperm has. So yeah, they just kind of sit there and do nothing, okay? And so there's one functional egg at the end. And it's a very expensive or energy, you know, rich deal. Okay, so we have one, you know, we get one a month. That's the energy we put into that one. 
Whereas for metagenesis, I didn't lie, right? It's cheap. It's cheap and easy, okay? Because they're not, they don't need to have this cell grow and collect all kinds of energy and store carbohydrates and fats and get gigantic. It's just DNA and a plasma membrane. Um, there's usually one mitochondria somewhere at the base of the tail here because we need some energy for that swimming motion. But otherwise, that's all that that has. So spermatogenesis works just like we were talking about meiosis. Oogenesis, you really just end up with one functional egg. So it's asymmetric cytokinesis, right? The DNA does what it's supposed to, but instead of pinching down the middle, you know, it just pinches off the tiny little guy, right, and, and keeps everything else with the one. Okay. And then the rest of this stuff you guys need to know um, about the structures and all the pieces and all that stuff, but I'm not going to read it to you because that's boring. Um, there's, again, a colorized version of the egg and all his little sperm friends. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I was going to... Hmm. Let's see. Let's see if I can find something quickly. Quickly. I'm supposed to load these already and I forgot. Talk amongst yourselves. Oh, come on. I give up. Can't get into my box. Close. I'll load the videos and show you guys tomorrow. I have a mitosis, a meiosis, and then after fertilization, the process, the mitosis going on. So I just want to show you guys those. They're fun. All right. So we're going to start chapter 13, genetics. I posted one little tutorial about sex determination, just the monohybrid cross, and then there's a little practice sheet. I don't know how many practice problems are in the back of this textbook, I can't remember, but I posted some little questions and I'll post the key tomorrow. So you guys can go through those and make sure you can do these problems. Okay, so Mendelian genetics is named after Gregor Mendel, right? He worked out the rules of inheritance using garden peas. So he spent a lot of time in his garden. He did a lot of observations before he started his experiments. And at least in the garden pea, there were for the traits that he ended up following, they only showed two different phenotypes. So pea plants were either really short or tall, yellow or green, smooth or wrinkled, and then a whole bunch of other traits. But there weren't any medium-sized peas. Not like people. People is a bell curve, right? From pretty short to ridiculously, to, to average to ridiculously tall. Right? That's a continuum. Anytime there's a continuum in any trait, it generally means it's not a one gene trait. Because if it's a one gene trait and there's essentially two alleles, you're going to get maybe two or three phenotypes, but they're going to be very distinct. Right? You're not going to get sort of that bell-shaped curve. So anything where you get a bell-shaped curve of a trait, height, weight, hair color, eye color, skin color, multiple genes involved in determining what those phenotypes are. When they're very distinct, tall and short, 
it's generally a one gene trait, right? Attached or detached, one gene trait. You have a straight forehead or the widow's peak, you know, little vampire guy, that's a one gene trait. Tongue rolling or not, you either have the gene or you don't, or the allele. If you can't do it, it's not because you're not trying hard enough. Now you don't, you literally do not have the musculature to turn your tongue like that, okay? Hitchhiker's thumb or not, like does your thumb bend backwards or does it go straight? It's a one gene trait, okay? So he picked things that were very discreet and distinct because you can't follow something that's on a continuum because you get too many variables, right? As scientists, you try to eliminate all the variables to come up with some sort of hypothesis about what's going on. So he chose traits that were very distinct, and then he watched how they were passed. Two shorts, do any talls ever come up? Two talls, do any shorts ever come up? Over and over and over for all these different traits. Trying to figure out how genetics are passed down, right? Sometimes offspring look like their parents and sometimes they don't, right? That's where it all began. But using a simple system instead of a ridiculously complex system, to study this. And then if you have a bunch of people from one plant, it may have, you know, 20 to 30 of those pods, which each one contains 10 or 15 seeds, lots of offspring to look at, right? If you use mice as your model system, they might have 12 offspring, and it takes, you know, three months to get those 12. From, from a pea plant, you might end up with, you know, 500 to 1,000 from one crop. The numbers matter because all of this, um, all of genetics essentially is probability, right? Which chromosome got into the gamete that made that offspring? It's probability, right? What are the chance that grandma went this way and grandpa went that way and there wasn't any grandpa on grandma that went that way? So it's all probability, and probability and numbers for probability only matter when there's lots of numbers, right? I bet all of us could throw 10 heads in a row on a, on a quarter, right? That's totally possible. Probability says it should be five and five, because there's two sides to the coin, right? It's a 50-50 chance every time you throw it. But we know you can get 10 in a row. Right? Does that mean probability is stupid and we shouldn't ever learn anything about it? <laughs> Maybe. No, it just means the numbers are too small for probability to work. Right? They never claimed probability is what happens. It's the likelihood by the numbers game of what should happen. Is it likely that you'll throw heads a hundred times in a row? No. Really, really unlikely. So, a hundred is a decent number for pro a thousand. What about a thousand? No, it's not going to freaking happen. So, that's an even better number for probability. Okay. So, anytime we're talking about small numbers, it's always the likelihood or it should happen that way. Doesn't mean it will. Okay. So, he used these because it gave him lots of numbers and play out in the fields and look at all kinds of stuff. So at the time, in the 1800s, the blending inheritance was what people thought happened. Nobody had any idea about genes or chromosomes, really, or how meiosis worked or anything. Right? They were just guessing. And so sometimes offspring look like a blend of their parents. So somehow they get all mixed up. And so you know, oh, but look, when we have a black sheep and a white sheep, we get a gray sheep, right? Sometimes you do. Sometimes you get black sheep, sometimes you get white sheep, right? But there are certain traits that do appear to blend, and so they said that's how it works. But Mendel said that that's crap because of all the stuff he saw with his little peas, and that sometimes a black and a white sheep, you get black sheep. So that didn't blend. So the rule of blending could not be universal. So he wanted to figure out how all these traits were passed. And again, model organisms that we use uh, should have a short, well, lifespan doesn't matter so much, but generally a shorter lifespan means an even shorter gestation period. So you can, you know, get lots, you get several rounds of crosses of peas all summer long, right? 
should be inexpensive to keep. You get lots of large numbers of offspring. Again, that's probability and something easy to work with. So some really common model organisms that we use in the lab now are, this is, ooh, sorry. This is, I'm drawing with white, that's helpful. Uh, yeast, a little roundworm guy, aw, a mouse, and Drosophila. And so mice are not ideal systems for genetics because you don't get a ton of offspring, but they're a great system because they're mammals, and as it turns out, they're, they're really similar to us in a lot of genetic ways, a lot of metabolic ways, and their immune system is really, really similar um, to humans. So lots of studies involving immune systems and drugs and cancer treatments are, are amazing to work with in mice because they're very similar to how their physiology reacts to things like ours does too. And so we wouldn't use mice to do our first experiments on genetics or first experiments with drugs, right? But they are a really good model system to go to before we go to clinical trials to make sure everything's safe and it looks like it's going to do something good. Okay. Uh, the features of our peas, like I said uh, before, plants have both male and female parts on the flower, right? And so uh, they can do themselves if they want to, or we can cross pollinate. And he could manipulate this by artificially making a flower either male or female. So, you know, he's <laughs> out there in his field with his little scissors and he's either cutting off the male parts, everybody cringes, or cutting off the female parts and essentially making one whole plant female and one whole plant male so they can't self-fertilize. So he can see who's the mom and who's the dad, what their phenotypes are, you know, so he can follow stuff. Right. And then you can also do a self-fertilization if you just want to see what happens, you know, that one plant on itself. Yeah. No. No. If you whack it, sorry, if you whack it off, that's not use that terminology. If you cut the parts off, sorry, it's an accident, then they, yeah, they don't regenerate. So, so, and a lot of times if you get, there's some of the uh, lily flowers that you get in bouquets, they cut the male parts off because the pollen is, you, you know, it's a really big, thick, full of pollen and it gets, makes a mess all over and people are really allergic to it. So sometimes flowers that you, you don't, you may never have, you may never have seen their boy parts because generally in bouquets are cut off because they make such a giant mess. Yeah, so they don't come back. Okay, so they're just showing how they can cut it off and then they can use a little paintbrush to take the pollen from whichever flower, whichever plant they want and put it onto the flower that they made only female. So they can totally con control who's the mom, who's the dad, and where the sperm and the eggs come from. And they call that cross-pollination if you do that, or self-pollination if it's just doing itself. Okay. And so what, else, what so these are some of the traits that he looked at. And so these are the ones that we'll be giving examples to. And what he did was he had this idea that there had to be something passed in the pollen between the two because, you know, you knew that's how fertilization happened and that's how you make seeds. And that there must be something that um, is responsible for these traits. So he's suspecting genes, right, DNA or chromosomes, that sort of thing. And so what he noticed is that when you self, if you take one plant, like a tall pea plant, and you self-fertilize it, sometimes you get talls and sometimes you, and some shorts, right? And if you take another tall plant and you self-fertilize it and you get tall, and you take that one and you self-fertilize it and you get tall, at some point, the short never come back out, right? And they call that true breeding or pure breeding. If you self-fertilize that tall plant, you only always get tall. So we would now know that only the tall alleles exist in that guy. Right? It's not heterozygous. It has to only have tall. Tall on tall only gives you tall if that's the only alleles that are in there. When he did the short guys, short on short always gave you short. You never got a tall on it. So, you know, you did it for several generations just to be sure a tall never popped back out and then said, okay, that, that plant is true breeding. So we know this is homozygous short, only has 
the particulate matter that causes short. So that's how he could then do his experiments across the tall and the short, because he knew the tall were pure tall and the short were pure short. So he had an idea of what particles, what genes were, what alleles were in those two plants. Okay. So they kind of like a purebred dog, except you know, purebred dogs aren't genetically identical to each other, but maybe for one trait, all the purebreds have that same, you know, trait. Just like the tall plants aren't identical in all their other traits, but just, you know, he's following that one, that one phenotype, that one gene. So that's what true breeding or a pure breeding or pure line means in genetics. When we talk about a hybrid, hybridizing essentially means it's not pure. It has traits from tall and short, right? When we think of a hybrid, we think of, you know, a, a tiger and a lion gives you a liger. And again, this guy has an odd number of chromosomes, so it's sterile, can't get through meiosis, so you can't ha do liger and liger, right? You have to kind of like mule on mule action, right? Same idea. But when we talk about hybridization or a hybrid in genetics, we just mean tall and short, something that's heterozygous, has an allele for tall and allele for short, okay? So a dihybrid cross, is talks about two different genes that are both heterozygous. A monohybrid cross is one gene, but heterozygous, a big T and a little t, right? Tall and short alleles in there. Okay. When we call something a parental generation in genetics, that would be, by definition, their true breeding. So if I told you it's parental purple and parental white, Right? We know both of these are true breeding. <laughs> okay. So, and that means, right, they have to be homozygous. And homozygous means the same. Two of the same alleles for every gene. Okay. So big P, big P, purple, little P, little P for white. Now, since he already did some of these experiments, he knew that true breeding purple gave purple, 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 purple. White could never give anything but that, always did white, 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 white. And when he crossed those two together, what came out in the F1, which by definition is a cross of the parentals, two true breeding together, always only gave us purple. All purple, always, only. So the white phenotype disappeared. So we know now that that means these guys were all big P, little P. They got a big P, the purple trait from whichever this mom, and the white from dad, but white is hidden, right, in the heterozygote, or masked. Whichever one shows up is the dominant trait, right? It overrides the other one. So just from this one simple experiment, we know that purple is dominant over white. Because in the F1, that's all we see. We don't see any white. Okay. And so what happened to the white? Did it go away? Did we lose it? No. Did we blend it? No. Where did it go? Yeah. It's, it's just hiding. Okay. So the, again, this is the F1. This is the parental. If we cross... And F2, by definition, is F1 times F1, okay? So either a self-fertilization of one plant or any of the F, you know, any of the, so it could be this guy on himself or that guy on that guy, right? That gives you the F2, by definition. So if I call it an F2, it had to be true breeding up here, had to go through this F1 hetero to this F2. And we see white coming back, mostly purple. Three quarters of them are purple, but one quarter of them are white. Okay. And so that's what he was trying to figure out. How does white disappear and then come back? He said it has to be some molecule that exists here. It's just hiding. We just don't see it. It can't have disappeared because then we'd have to say, spontaneous generation recreated alleles that, you know, occurred in these offspring. 
right? Conservation of matter. We can't just have things popping in and out, right? They had had to be there in the F1. We just didn't see it. So the F1 tells you what's dominant and recessive. Exactly. Whichever one you see is the dominant, and, or you could say, well, it shows me recessive by what I don't see. Right? So either one. So anytime you're asked something about which one's dominant or recessive, this experiment could be set up and you'd say, well, whichever one, whichever phenotype shows up in the F1 is the dominant phenotype. The dominant phenotype. Yes, and that, by definition, makes the white recessive. And so those terms, dominant and recessive, refers to who wins the phenotype. The genotype, the alleles are there, it's just do they win or not. And for any specific trait, it's either dominant or recessive. It doesn't change. So in this kind of garden pea, purple is always dominant no matter which plants you look at. That doesn't mean the purple is dominant in snapdragons or whatever, but in this type of plant, if tall is dominant, it's always dominant, right? And so for traits, I'm not going to try to make you guys memorize which ones are dominant, which ones are recessive, right? You'll either be told or you'll be told something about an experiment that tells you, right? So I won't expect you to know that tall is dominant or widow's peak is dominant or tongue rolling is dominant, right? You'll either be told or I'll say two true breeding, blah, 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 the F1 looked hitchhiker some, you know, and then that's dominant, okay? So you'll either be told or, you know, and same with the diseases we'll talk about because I don't care about memory. Some of them you'll end up remembering just because, you know, you'll look at them enough, but we don't need to memorize that kind of stuff. So these generally have nothing to do with fitness or natural selection, right? A trait is dominant or recessive and that's just the way it is. If that purple trait was um, somehow deleterious to that plant, like bees don't like purple, they only like red or they like white and it doesn't, then it just disappears. Right? It just goes away because they don't get pollinated, they don't make seeds, they die. Right? It's not because purple was so much better than white that you get three quarters of them. Right? That's just what appears. What happens after that, if they get grazed or they don't get fertilized, whatever, that's all natural selection. But the genetics is just the genetics. It's just how it works. Okay. No blending, blah, blah, blah. We talk about genes. Let's see. Okay. So again, this is the definition of genes and allele. I talked about that during mitosis because it's a concept that seems to throw people, right? So all of us have two copies of every gene, right? One on each of the homologous chromosomes. The alleles are the versions of that gene, detached or attached, tongue roller, not tongue roller. Right, it's still the gene that gives that musculature in your tongue. Okay. The principle of segregation is that the alleles come apart during meiosis. Okay. That if you're heterozygous, you don't pass that heterozygous trait to your offspring. Right? Because heterozygous means big R, little r. And we know if you are big R, little r, we're, gonna, we're just going to pretend, look, here's your chromosome. This is chromosome 11. I don't know. I have no, you know, I'm making it up, right? And so both sisters on that one are big R, both sisters on that one are little r, right? The sister chromatids came from replication. They're exactly the same as the originals. But this one, actually, I should have drawn one blue. We'll draw this guy blue. Right, because here's grandpa, grandma, chromosome. Okay. When you end up making gametes, what happens? That guy goes this way, meiosis one. Right, these are little r's. These are big r's. The alleles come apart. Right, they don't stay together. 
You can't have big R, little r in a gamete. You have half big R and half little r. Because then if we, you know, finish meiosis and we pull apart, oh, stop it. Oh, that's an interesting color. Right, we pull apart those guys and we pull apart these guys. Right, this is a big R, this is a big R, little r, little r. Right, each gamete only has one gene, one of the alleles. That's all segregation is. Right, that, that heterozygous, those two alleles don't stay together into the offspring. Right? You get one allele from mom and one allele from dad. And it's 50-50 chance, right? 50% of the sperm are going to have big R, 50% of the sperm are going to have little r. Who wins the race in, you know, the plant? Who gets down the, the tube fastest? Random, right? Could be the big r, could be the little r. 50-50 chance, okay? Oh, I scribbled all over this. So when we talk about which one's dominant and which one's recessive, by convention, anything dominant is a capital letter. So that also tells you something. If I say uh, the hairy ear gene is denoted capital R, you know it's a dominant trait. Whereas, you know, the, the, the no-haired ear is a little r. You know it's recessive, right? So that just automatically tells you. So if something is true breeding dominant, it's got to have two big R's, right? And then if you think about it, well, what kind of gametes could this guy make? Big R's. 100% of the gametes are big R's. There's nothing else that guy could make. So if we did the plant self-fertilization, this guy would get together with that guy, we'd be back to big R, big R. That's why it's true breeding. That's all they have, right? True breeding recessive has to be lowercase, lowercase. And again, that's all they have. Take them apart, put them back together. It's still lowercase, lowercase. Still recessive. True breeding. But if you cross this guy with this guy, right, and this, right, this guy's only got little r's, this guy's only got big r's, and these two guys get together, now we make heterozygous. That would be our F1. What does that phenotype look like? Yeah, whatever the heck that dominant is. Whatever hairy ears. <laughs> whatever it happens to be. And then you know, right, the other one's the recessive trait. So if you weren't told which was which and that you just had two things that were true breeding, true breeding, um, fat and skinny, right, what comes out in the F1? Fat. Okay, that's dominant over skinny, or vice, whatever comes out. If I said, what if skinny came out in the F1? Well, then that one would be dominant. Okay. And so that's all this little guy shows, right? A Punnett square is the cheapy way to do probability without doing math. What's better than that? We can do probability by math, and when we get more complicated stuff in 360, we have to use the math because the Punnett squares get you gigantic. But the Punnett square is just doing the probability for us. And so I don't like how they start out the little example because it, to me it's a little bit confusing because we know this guy, little r, little r, half the gametes are little r and half the gametes are little r, right? We know this guy, Half the gametes are big R, half the gametes are big R. And so if we were going to do a representation of how you could do all of them, I prefer the Punnett square to look more like this so it doesn't confuse people later. Right? It's just showing us the probability of all the possible combinations of these gametes. Right, so this one is a gamete, that's a gamete, this is a gamete, this is a gamete. If this one and this one got together, we'd have big R, little r.
If this one and this one got together, we'd have big R, little r. If this one and this one got together, we'd have big R, little r. Oh, fascinating. It's riveting. If this one and this one got together, we'd have big R, little r. That's all the poss possibilities. We did every single combination. We could also have just gone big R, big R times little r, little r, and said, okay, this one and this one, this one and this one, this one and this one, and this one and this one. Those are all the combinations, okay? But this stupid little square is sort of idiot proof. You can't forget to grab one because you have to fill in the stupid square. If you end up and you have a blank square, fill it in, <laughs> right? You have to be able to do that. And so this just tells us exactly what that stupid cross said, right? This is the F1. And they're all big R, little r. A cross of two breeding, tr two breeding, true breeding always gives you all heterozygous offspring. And whatever their phenotype is tells you which one's dominant. Okay. So in this case, if we didn't know anything about genotypes, we're going to cross that out. And I said a wrinkled P times a smooth P gives you all smooth P's, which one's dominant? Smooth. Right? I didn't give you any letters, so you couldn't just go by the capital. Or if the question says, you know, they all look smooth, which is the recessive trait? Make sure you're reading the question in case I switch it up. Your brain will want to say, you know, think dominant, but if I'm asking recessive, make sure you go, oh, not smooth. Right? The wrinkled one is the recessive. And so then here's our little picture. What if, now this would be the F1 cross, right? Two heterozygotes, heterozygote on heterozygote is the F1 cross to give us the F2. And remember we did the white and purple, that's when our whites showed back up, right? Our F1 guys are both smooth. We know they're heterozygous. If we set up the stupid square, again, right, half would be big R, half will be little r, right? That's what he's got to give away. Half would be big R, half is little r. That's what she's got to give away. And then, it's, again, it's just over and down, over, down, over, down, over, down. And by phenotype, if we can't look at their genes and we're just visualizing, how many smooths are there? Right, there's three out of four. So we can just count one, two, three, and how many squares are there? Four. So three fourths. It did the math for us. Woohoo! Which we know is 75%. And then one out of four, or one fourth, is wrinkled, is the recessive. If we look at the genotypes, let's say we know the genotypes, we did the sequencing, right? Then we have to consider this guy is the homozygous dominant. These two are heterozygous. This guy is homozygous recessive, right? The genotypes are one fourth. One in four, big R, big R. Two out of four, big R, little r. One out of four, little r, little r. Okay. These two things never ever change. You do not even need to draw a Punnett square if I ask you what do the offspring look like or what are the genotypes of the offspring of a heterozygote on a heterozygote. Because you will get this every single time. You can't not. You have to. Right? What if I tell you big T, little t times big T, little t? Everybody draw this on screenshot and upload if we haven't done anything today. Right? We set up our stupid Punnett square. It does not matter if mom, <laughs> maybe it does, but not for genetics. It does not matter if mom's on top or dad's on top. Okay? And you, <laughs> and you can do it both ways and do the experiment to show yourself that it doesn't matter. 
Doesn't matter if we put big T, little t from this one. I'll do different colors just so it helps us follow who's who. And big T, little t down there. Because again, it's probability. We're just counting one, how many squares out of four. Doesn't matter where they are. The only way you guys can mess this up is if you take a big T from one, if you put both big T's on top and both little T's on the side, then you're screwed, right? You have to keep, you know, the gametes from one of the knuckleheads on one side and the gametes on the other. You can do it down this way and across this way too if you want to, if you want to just go rogue and be nutty, okay? So that doesn't matter as long as, right, each individual, mom is on top, or dad is on top, but not part of mom and part of dad, because that doesn't work. That, yes, you can if you can do it quickly. All right, so fill in your squares. You can tell me. So that would be a question that I might ask. I might say, what is the, what the heck am I doing? Here we go. What is the phenotypic ratio and what is the genotypic ratio? Okay, so if I say, what's the pheno ratio? And what's the geno ratio? Right, the phenotype is what they look like. And so for this, since I didn't tell you what the T stands for, you'd have to say, you know, three, four, right, either how many dominant, how many look recessive. And then the genotype doesn't change. You can just see that it's, you know, the ratio for this for genotype is always one to two to one. It has to be. Right, when you do the Right, we'll put our, bring our T's over first, then we'll bring our T's down, and then our T's over. Those are our genotypes. The genotypes are always just the letters, right? So if you're asked some, you know, if you're given a stupid paragraph, a whole bunch of crap, and then you're asked a question, you've got to figure out what of that paragraph full of crap is actually useful. And if I'm asking for genotypes, it's always going to be letters. So, you know, homozygous dominant, what's the genotype? You'd want to pick big T, big T, not, some, not little t, little t. You know that can't be dominant. And you don't want to pick tall because that's a phenotype. So what do we got for phenotypic ratio? Yes. And how about geno? All right, screenshot and upload. So you can do this one a billion times and it never changes. So that means you don't even have to do it if you just know this. This is okay to memorize, right? Anytime two heterozygous are crossed, it's three to one phenotype, one to two to one genotype. It's always this, it's always one homozygous dominant, one homozygous recessive, and two heterozygous. The genotypic ratio, there's one homozygous dominant, there's two of four, right? So, so this, this is the same as saying three-fourths and one-fourth, or one-fourth to two, whoops, to two-fourths to one-fourth, right? Because in math, if you, divi you can divide or multiply numbers, as long as it's the same number, it doesn't change the value, right? So we don't have to include the four. So the fraction is one-fourth to two-fourths to one-fourth, or one-fourth to one-half to one-fourth. The ratio is one to two to one, right? The fraction is three-fourths to one-fourth. The ratio is three to one. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So all of these monohybrid crosses have predicted outcomes in the Punnett square. You can always do the Punnett square to make sure you're not messed up, but as you move on in biology and genetics, the, the more that you just know what the answer is going to be, the easier it'll be for you. You don't have to spend a bunch of time. You don't want to spend time doing a Punnett square on a heterozygous cross when you want to spend more time thinking about a problem that you need more time for. Right, that one you should be able to just find the answer in 15 seconds. Right, you read it, oh, it's just hetero on hetero. She's asking how many homozygous dominant, one and four. Right, I don't need to draw that to know it because it never changes. 
And so all of these are the same thing. Okay? And I suggest you write these out as a Punnett square to help you. We're going to do this one right now, and we're going to screenshot and upload. <coughs> No, that, that, is that the one that we just, that was the top one? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to do that cross. So you're going to do Punnett square for me. You're going to give me the phenotypic ratio and the genotypic ratio. And then you're going to screenshot and upload. No. If there's a zero, sorry, I just changed that one. Okay. So we're going to do two. Yeah. Quickly, because we have two minutes. <laughs> sorry. So if you did this guy, right, the next guy is that one. So you're going to do two squares, two uploads. We're going to do that one? Yes. Yeah. Double, double. Uh, ooh, double double. I'm hungry. And then hetero on recessive homo. I guess I could have drawn them on the same page for you guys. That would have been helpful. The other one is this one. Page two. Sorry. And then after you get your answer, you're going to go back a couple slides and look and see. Right, yes, I just proved what Malone said that always happens. And so again, for this test, for you guys, you'll have time to do the Punnett squares for these. In genetics, you don't get time to do anything monohybrid. You have to just know. But for these, you can just, you'll have time. But if you save time on these by knowing it, it'll give you more time on harder stuff that, you know, that you're allocated one minute, you get to use two minutes or three minutes. Yeah, you can do it. Well, but do two uploads because, you know, we need points, <laughs> right, don't we? Yeah, yeah, so we'll use all three today. Woohoo! Okay. So in this case, right, but we would actually write this as a one. Because it's four out of four. And four out of four. So we call it one. Yep. Exactly. It would be one to one. Because you could do, because like two, four, two out of four to two out of four is. Yeah. So you can do least common. 